Has everyone joined this morning? That means you have to respond extra nicely today because it's my birthday. You know, wives have this thing, hey, where they say, it's your birthday, you can have whatever you want. <laughs> now, honestly, this is what Alyssa said to me three, I, I just, this is not in my notes, but just before we start, you can have whatever you want. I said, okay, I'd like to go play golf for the day. No, you can't do that. <laughs> it's like... What? Why would you ask? Like, I don't understand. Oh, no, you've got a family now. You need to spend time. I said, you said I could have whatever I wanted. And all the men said, amen. Maybe we'll have a men's event every, like, three weeks or something, and we'll just all go play golf together. Um, we'll be at the Growling Frog today at 2 p.m. Uh, tee off time is at 2.02, um, and we're looking forward to it. Um, if you want to join us, uh, I don't know. Is there any more tea times? We're not sure. Uh, I'm just going to beat Aaron and a few others, and uh, we'll see how we go. But anyway, um, I've been in our campuses for the last few weeks. Uh, it's been an incredible thing seeing God move uh, in Craigieburn and uh, Doreen. And, you know, as we're worshipping in these areas, and uh, like literally during worship at one point, like, you could just sense God's hand over the place. You could just sense God is moving. And so can I just encourage you, uh, if you're visiting here, if you didn't even know we had locations there or whatever, but could you continue to pray for them, the locations, the leaders, uh, the pastors there, Mark, Jana, Colin, and Teresa, they are doing an exceptional job. God is moving. The places are growing. Uh, and this is a good problem to have, uh, but we are excited, but we always want God's hand on it and in it. And, um, you know, we're just believing God for more. So if you're going, how do I pray for this? Pray for their leaders. Uh, pray for more. Yeah. Yeah. I'll say that again. Pray for more. Yeah. Yeah. Praying for God to move more in those spaces. And uh, let's just believe uh, next year God is going to move greatly. Also in Bandura, though. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah. We're not just praying for other camp. We believe this place is going to grow yeah. uh, week in and week out. Uh, we are not just getting comfortable here going, oh, this is cute. Like, as in, no, we want to grow each week. We're going to invite our friends to church. Yeah. Uh, we're going to believe that God is going to move here more and more. Uh, who enjoyed our Galatians series? Yeah. Could we put our hands together for Pastor John and Pastor Alyssa who share? They did an incredible job. Um, you know, for, I just wanted to explain that because, you know, it's a, it's a, it was great to dig into the Word together, and we want to do that once or twice a year, just sp spend time in a specific book. Uh, but for my wife, I don't know if you guys know that, but she works like a, two days a week at the church. So when she, and she's running our Accelerate program and all these things. So she's writing these messages. Uh, the whole family's running together. No, um, but, you know, she's writing these messages. And, and honestly, uh, it's, a, it's a huge workload, the, the work that she puts in, the heart that she puts into it. And I just wanted to honour her this morning because she does such an incredible job bringing the word. Um, and I say all that to also uh, honour Pastor John, who brought an incredible message last week. It was great to have him back on platform. Um, he, he will be preaching and sharing in this campus and our other campuses probably, uh, you know, once every one to two uh, months because he's also, he's, get, he's, he's pretty popular, this guy. And uh, he gets invited to other churches and he's constantly cancelling on... No, I'm just joking. <laughs> We're having a lot of email trials at the moment. It's funny. Um, but, you know, um, he's a blessing. Our church is stronger uh, when we have Pastor John preaching here. Our, our, our church is stronger when Pastor Lois and John are ministering here. And so we want to take full advantage of that as here. One last serious announcement is tonight. It's India versus Australia in the World Cup cricket. And, and I'm saying, so for the, I'm going, we are going to win. When I say we, I mean India, firstly. <laughs> For the two Australians I offended here, I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, honestly, really believing that it's going to be a great game. Um, can I just, if you're Sri Lankan, you need to go for India. I'm just letting you know, if Sri Lanka was playing Australia, I'd go for Sri Lanka. I just want to put that out there. But this, some of you are going, I don't care about cricket, move on. I'm moving on. But uh, I'm just saying, I'm going to be up late tonight at 4 a.m., it's my birthday. <laughs> Am I allowed? I don't even know anymore. <laughs> What's going on here? Anyway, today we are bringing the focus for 2024, and uh, we're going to get in the word right now. But, you know, this year um, we've had a focus on kingdom. Everyone say kingdom. kingdom. 
It's all been about kingdom uh, relationships, kingdom giving, and kingdom li- living. And we don't want, we're not going to lose this emphasis, you know, throughout uh, next year and the years to come. Because in the end, with kingdom giving, it was all about really having a heart for the kingdom. It means we wanted to be more generous. We wanted to give more. And this year, we've had a great impact across the globe. Uh, in Bandura, Jinnu and Nithya have led up our missions program. And they've done an incredible job making sure that we are kingdom giving, as in, as in we are putting God first. We are seeking first the kingdom of God. And then in life groups, it is so great to see that uh, people, there's a warmth in the church, and it's not just the heater. You know, like as in there's a warmth in the where people want to connect with each other. People want to talk with each other. People are cooking meals for each other. And I think that's just such a beautiful thing. Like I heard of a uh, new person that, or new, new-ish, like Kitty, you're like, you've been a year, right? Like as in so, like she's been in our church like for a year, um, but then, like, Sweetie, who's been in our church for, like, 18 months, like, she, Kitty was sick, and then Sweetie cooked, like, organized a meal trail for, like, five, ten days. Like, as in, how, how beautiful is that? That is church community. That is the real deal. So kingdom community was taking place in relationships and kingdom living. That people in their personal lives were putting God first. There was an orientation towards the kingdom of God, that we had a kingdom perspective in everything we do. And so today, the reason why we're doing uh, um, vision, it's November, isn't it? November 19th. My birthday was yesterday, just to let you know. But um, but, um, it's November 19th. The reason why we're doing it, we want it to marinate in your hearts for the next few weeks and months. When we head into fasting and prayer, which is the 8th of January, we want to be praying into this. We want to believe um, together and pray together about the vision. But uh, let's pray now and uh, let's believe God's going to move. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for your house and we thank you for your people, God. And right now we, we come to you and we ask that you speak to us. We come to you and we've already sensed your presence in such a deep way. And so right now I pray that you continue to do this work. That it won't just be a by accident we are here, but we will hear from you directly. Our lives will be transformed this morning in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said? Amen. A- that was a strong amen. Um, so at the start of this year, one of my good friends from high school, who is Serbian Orthodox, he got uh, married. And uh, we went to this Orthodox church and it was very, it was a very beautiful building. You know, it was positioned high and, uh, you know, one of those old school buildings, really beautiful. There was a presence about this building. But, you know, when uh, a building is so beautiful and, and things like that, um, when you're managing your kids at a wedding, who knows it's very difficult. I'm on edge when I'm managing my kids at restaurants and stuff like that. So anyway, I'm taking in this 18-month-year-old and, and three-year-old, and what I noticed was that the place was so busy. It was, there was hundreds of people, right, at this wedding. People were standing inside. It was standing room only, and they were standing outside also. Okay, so it's a busy church. And we're all, like, looking, trying to look in from the outside. But people's behavior was so different whether they were inside and outside. Do you know what I mean? Like, so on the inside, they were very, like, they were very, like, holy. You know, like, as in they were... Glasses were off, hidden away. The cigarette that they had in their ears, like, was, was kind of put away. They're kids. You were like, shh. Like, shh, everything. But then you step outside, and you can still see everything that's taking place. You step outside, and everyone's going nuts. Like, kids are running around like crazy people, like, as did, um, literally, one step outside the door. People are just smoking outside, just having, what, like, taking phone calls, messaging, et cetera, et cetera. Some of you are going, I see this here, too. I say, okay, cool, cool, whatever. But, um... But, like, I just thought there was such a difference between stepping in and out of this building. Once someone crossed this invisible line, something changed in people. And I remember the same feeling taking place when we did a Europe trip, like, and we were walking through Italy and we were doing one of those walking tours. And what takes place is, is that you're walking around and they're saying, hey, look at this building, look at this beautiful church, et cetera, et cetera. And Alyssa and I, we're yelling at each other, we're eating, we're doing whatever we want. And then you step into one of those beautiful churches and everything changes. Firstly, you're not allowed to eat inside, so therefore you're just chucking your stuff away. And then all of a sudden, you're, you're not like, you're not yelling anymore. You're going, babe, babe, I'm so happy. I'm so happy. And, and there's a sense of reverence. Everyone know what I'm talking about? Like, there's just this sense of awe of going, hey, 
We've got to be respectful here. There, there's, we've got to slow down here. Everything changes. And there was a sense of purity, of sanctity, of holiness. There's a sense that this is a holy place. Everyone say holy place. This is a holy place. Exodus chapter 3, this is the text we're going to look at today. And then I'm, I'm going to try and, I'm trying not to say what the vision is without saying what the vision is. I'm going to try and hold off, but I'm going to say it in the next 30 seconds, okay? But this is the text for today. Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. I have one of those. Anyway, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb. I'm, I'm in a, anyway, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So although the bush was on fire, it was not consumed. It, it, was, it was its own entity. It did not need the bush to be fueled. Anyway, when, Mo, when the Lord saw that Moses had gone to have a look, God called him and said, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Everyone say, here I am. Here I am. Anyway, verse 5, it says, Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place that you are standing is holy ground. This is our, our, our first, Alyssa and I, our first vision to kind of put out an emphasis for the next 12 months. And I remember going to bed during this time because Pastor John and Lois have, has done vision for Encompass Church for the last 25 years. That's a long time. And you realize on your first go, uh, it better be good, you know, like, as in uh, no pressure. And, and I remember going to bed one night and I said, God, I just, I don't want a good idea. I don't want to just reverse engineer what all of you are thinking and going, hey, this, let's choose something fun. You know what I mean? Let's just choose the answer that the people need. No, I don't want a good answer. I want to know your heart. Or Encompass Church. I want to know what you want for this place. For every person in this room, I want to know what you have to say to them. And instantly, God put these few words in my heart, and um, I didn't say, wow. I actually said, uh-oh. I didn't say, how exciting. I said, oh, how are we going to position this? And anyway, to cut straight to the point, the, the words that... God gave me for the next 12 months is this. The, the focus and vision is this is holy ground. Yeah. Yeah. This is holy ground. Turn to your neighbor, put your hand on your heart, and as you turn to them, just say, this is holy ground. Just, this is holy ground. And immediately I sense God uh, bring some clarity and focus to me uh, in this moment is that the flesh wants higher ground. And I thought higher ground would be a great idea. Like, as in, we could put that in big stickers everywhere. But the thing is, is that the Spirit desires holy ground. Yeah. I even imagined myself preaching on, like, uh, ladders going, wow. Like, as in, this is holy ground. You know what I mean? Like, as in, I was going higher and higher. But then God said, no, I want you on your knees because this is holy ground. Everyone say, this is holy ground. This is holy ground. Ground. God wants us to seek him more. You know, uh, God also told me, if you seek holy ground in every location, and, and the campuses aren't listening today, but if you seek holy ground in here in Bandura, I will lead you to higher ground. Don't desire great heights, but desire holiness. The other thing he said to me is, don't think that holy ground is something far off and far away. It is not a foreign place, but holy ground is is right where you stand. It isn't about a beautiful building. It's not about being distant and remote. But holy ground is right where we are right now. To say that this is holy ground is to say, God, I don't want to go anywhere without your presence. I don't want to go anywhere without your hand and heart on it. We don't want to go anywhere without your presence. So what is holy ground? Well, let's start with the word holy because we sing songs about God's holiness all the time. I would sing you a few songs right now, but I think I can actually. Um, remember that song? Holy, holy, holy. Anyone with me here? Yeah. Holy, holy. Yeah. Oh, da, da, da. Yeah, it's good. Okay, we, listen. 
Some of you that don't know it, that was a dope beat back in the day. Okay? And you need to check your lyrics and check your words and stuff. Alvin Slater. Uh, Alvin Slaughter, sorry. And um, there's, there's many songs, like as in, holy, holy, are you Lord God Almighty? You know, we sing holy songs all the time. But the thing is, the word holy, what are we actually singing? Well, it's from the Hebrew word kodesh. It's spelt with a Q, kodesh, and it means to be cut off, to separate, to be set apart. It is in a class of its own. This is not economy class and first class. You can't even imagine the class that God is in. It is distinct from anything else that has ever existed. There is no comparison for holy ground. Kodesh also means to be entirely morally pure. That's not that popular. To be entirely morally pure all the time and in every way. So when you say or when you are singing, holy, 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 it is to say that God occupies a moral space that no one has ever occupied before. It is to say that there is no frame of reference to understand him. There is nothing, no one like him. That's his holiness. Why is God holy? No, number one is that he is unique and precious. Exodus 15, 11, who is like you, God? Who is, among, uh, the, who is like you, O oh, oh Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness? You know, if you've ever thought you can understand God, if you've ever think, I've worked him out. I've learned enough theology. I've learned enough science about him. Let me tell you something. Your scientific and your theological truth should always lead you to a deeper encounter with God. More knowledge should lead to deeper intimacy. It it should lead us to a sense of awe and wonder. Who is like God? There is no one like him. Not only is he unique, but he is powerful. He is all powerful. Ezekiel chapter 38 verse 23, it says, So I will show my greatness and my holiness and make myself known to all the nations. They will know that I am the Lord. You know, we will never really understand the magnitude and the greatness of him. And finally, it is to say that he is the source of all things. Isaiah 6 verse 3, it says, and they were calling to him, this seraphim, this, uh, this prophetic image that Isaiah received, and it, was, and it was saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Holy, holy, holy. Everyone say, holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I had a really good friend, best friend in year seven named David Scott, okay? Yes, he was Australian. And um, he was... It's a very Australian name, but David Scott. Very tall. He's, you know, Nick Rewalt, the footballer? It was actually his cousin. So that's sort of, think about that height. We were best friends for the first two years of high school. This guy was super tall. You know the movie Twins? Like, and Danny DeVitt? It was that kind of combo. Like, people used to be like, what's going on here? Anyway, um, and so, like, as it was, and when, you, when I described him to people, what would I say? I'd be like, no, Dave, Dave's really, he's tall. And I, but I wouldn't just be like tall. I'd be like, he's tall, tall. Do you know what I mean? No, no, no. He is tall, tall, tall. And when this seraphim is describing God, when he's, when he's seeing, he's saying, hold, no, he's not just holy. He is holy, holy. He is more, more holy than you could ever comprehend or ever imagine. He is holy, holy, holy. So when we say or when we sing God is holy, it's saying God is unique, God is powerful, and he is the source of all things. But this is holy Ground. Everyone say ground. ground. Well, the ground's just the ground's just the ground. There is no difference. The, the only difference with the ground here is that God is present. Yeah. Yeah. That's what makes holy ground. Yeah. So when you go to Bunnings and you buy premium soil or potting soil or uh, the normal soil, whatever it is, so some of you are going, I know exactly what you're talking about. As in, there's differences. There's different ingredients. There's different situations that make it better. It's more expensive, et cetera, et cetera. But when it comes to holy ground, there's only one kind. There is only one kind. Wherever God is, is holy. Wherever God is, is holy. Whatever, wherever God is, is sacred and set apart. There is nothing like it. And we, you and I, we've learned it throughout the Galatians series. If you've ever given your heart, to Jesus, we have been purchased by the blood of Jesus. 
And when we received him as our Lord and Savior, guess what? He made us holy. If you've ever said, Jesus, I want to make you Lord and Savior, he has made you holy. 1 Corinthians 3.16, it says, don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and the Spirit of God lives in you. Everyone say, lives in me. The Spirit of God lives in me. God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple, for God's temple is holy. And you are that temple. Therefore, to say that this is holy ground is to say that this is holy ground. Everywhere we are, if you've given your heart to Jesus, this is holy ground. That means that we have been called to be set apart. That means we have been called to be distinct, to be morally pure. There should be something different about us. You might be asking, um, does that mean like I'm holy right now or do I work into this holiness situation? You know what I mean? Like, Have you ever thought about that? It's like, I, I don't feel very holy. Like you should have seen the car ride here today. Like, as in, it was crazy. But like, am I holy now? And the answer is yes. You are holy now, but you are growing in holiness. You are holy today, but we are supposed to go through the sanctifying process growing in him. We are holy, but we are called to grow in holiness. First Peter one chapter, sorry, chapter one, verses fifteen and sixteen. But as he who is who has called you is holy. And he says, Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. You know, a lot of us want to be like Jesus. Who wants to be like Jesus here? We all want to be like Jesus. We like the gracious side. We love the loving side. We love the the fun side, Jesus is playing with the kids or, you know, meeting people and building disciples, the leadership side. But some of us, a lot of us actually, I think, we avoid the holy side. Mm -hmm. To follow Jesus is to be like him and is to desire holiness. This is holy ground. So for the next... Like, I reckon I've got about 10 minutes left. I'm just going to see I'm going to skip out of this thing, and then we're going to have a time of worship. But I just want to give some, a framework, three words that we can carry into these next few months that, can, that we can just carry to say, hey, when, when I think this is holy ground, these are the three things that I, I want us to follow a little bit at this point. And we're going to go back to Exodus chapter 3. And we found that Moses was doing very normal things. He was, he was running errands. He was having a latte in bed every morning like I make my wife. You know what I mean? Like, as in, he had done this a thousand times. He was doing everything that he would normally do. He was been doing this for 40 years for his father-in-law. Even a burning bush, you might go, whoa, a burning bush. But in the desert, this is a bramble bush. This is just, this is normal. For a bush to burn in the desert was a normal thing. But yet there was something different about this day. Moses was seeing things differently. Moses had an awareness that day that maybe he had before or he hadn't. But here's the thing. Moses had a little bit of wonder about him. He had a little bit of wonder. And to really embrace holy ground, this is the first three-letter word I want you to grab, is that we need to open our eyes to see. Everyone say see. 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 Just elbow your neighbor and say see. See, 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 I told you. To really embrace that this is holy ground, you need to open your eyes and see. Let there be an awareness. Let there be a holy wonder about us. Maybe you look at spreadsheets all day, or maybe you cook all the time, or maybe your life just feels like you're changing nappies, cooking meals, spending time with the same people, doing the same things all the time. Let me tell you something. God wants you to be more aware right now than you've ever been. God wants you to open your eyes and see. He wants you to see see something that you've never seen before. He wants you to wonder again. Wonder means to be amazed, to be fascinated, astonished, surprised. I pray that we are a church that never loses its wonder. I don't want to ever lose my wonder. You know, I don't know if you realize this, but... Um, we lose 90% of our imagination and creativity by the age of seven. 
you know when you're, you're 40? I'm not 40 yet, just, just saying. You know when you're 40? Do you know how much creativity you have? You have 2% creativity. 2%. I'm 36. Therefore, I've got about 2.34% left. This is not good, people. Like, as in, this is not enough creativity. This is not enough imagination. But here's the thing is when wonder is dead, when creativity is dead, the soul becomes dry. And I wonder how many people in the room today has lost their wonder. I wonder how many of us, when I say, this is holy ground, you're going, I don't see it. And maybe we've got to open our eyes. So God, what are you doing? Whether it be in corporate worship like this morning or personal devotion, let's have an attitude of wonder. Let's have eyes that see, that are aware, that will be open to seeing his move. There are so many burning bushes in our lives. There are so many burning bushes in our lives. The question is, can you see it? Will you see it? Will you wonder? You know, we sing this song, and we might sing it a bit later. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your vision. Let us become more aware of your presence. You know, that's not just for a dark room with lights and a singer on stage. That's, let us become more aware in the board meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Let us become more aware when I'm doing school drop-off. Yeah. Let us become more aware of your presence when I'm making a delivery, when I'm flying on that flight. Whatever you might be doing, let us become more aware of your presence. This is holy. I pray that we'll be, we will begin to see God in places that we've never seen him before. And you've gone, I've always, I've always taken this route to church, or I've always taken this route to work, but you will see things. There will be an awareness. There will be a holy wonder in your walk. Everyone say, see. 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 Next one. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to, to, to look, God called to him from within the bush, and he said, Moses Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Let me tell you something. It says here, when the Lord saw that he went over to look. God is looking to see how you'll respond. God is looking to see, will you, will you follow that little, like, you know, that unction, that Holy Spirit unction in you to say, actually, that's a, this is a God moment. Will you follow it? Will you be bold enough? And he is seeing how you will respond. And then he calls you out saying, Moses, Moses. Verse 5, do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, no socks at all, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the Father, I am God of your Father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face. Watch how Moses responds to the presence of God. It's with reverence. He says, here I am. It's a sense of unworthiness to take off your shoes. He is going, this, the presence of God is so beautiful here. I am not good enough to be here. So he literally takes off his shoes. And when he hides his face, there is a holy fear and respect for the presence of God. To say that um, this is holy ground isn't just to see. This one's not going to make us very popular today. Is it? It's not just to see God, but it's to bow before him. It's not just to see, but it will be a life that bows and burns for God. That's what Moses was doing in this moment. He was bowing his life before God. This was a holy posture. Not just holy awareness, but this is a holy posture. About a year ago, um, my boss, a wife, um, <laughs> you saw her earlier with the birthday situation, you know. But uh, we're having a birthday, and um, Amara, I think, was turning like, I don't know, a year or something. And about two weeks out of this birthday, do you know what she, you know what she does? She says, hey, babe, we're having the birthday outside. Now, our backyard is pretty big, and it looked terrible. And what she was saying is, Jace, we're having our birthday outside. It's in two weeks' time. You've got to clean this up. <laughs> and I'm like going, like, this wasn't a normal clean. Like, this was not just basic weeding and, and blowing around the leaves. She bought a can of paint. Go paint that. Like, she's never bought a can of paint ever, but she bought that can of paint. I'm spraying 40 metres of fence, people. Like, this is crazy. We all of a sudden could buy new trees. Do you remember that? It was like, <laughs> it was like we're buying new trees. So I'm not just weeding. I'm now planting new trees. 
I love those trees. And she knew this was close to my heart, but she took full advantage of this two-week situation. I have to take leave for this situation. Like, I said, a lot of work. And all the men said, Guys, we're going to have to do more men's events to fix this. Anyway, um, but, but, but here's the thing. We realized how much everything changed because people were coming over. I was willing to change so many things in my backyard because I was having guests, because I was having people. Anyone get what I'm saying here? But here's the thing. This is holy ground. I have the Spirit of God in me. You have the Spirit of God in you. How much more should we be cleaning up our lives? How much more should our lives be, be bowing before him and going, I've got to pull some stuff out here. I need to be addressing this. I don't need to be painting the fence. I need to be demolishing that fence. There are certain areas of your life, and here's the thing. When it comes to people, it's an easy cleanup. But when it comes to God, you don't bow. I believe in this, this future, this, in these next 12 months, God is going to ask you to bow before him. I'm not, God has not called us to popularity He's called us to purity. I know I'm not, this is not how to grow a church.com, like as in to preach about bowing, right? But this is the heart of God for you and I personally, corporately. And I truly believe if we will see him, but we will also bow before him, that we will have lives that bow before him, I believe God will show us and reveal himself to us that we will be a people that would live our lives set apart, distinct and pure. Next year uh, in February, we have uh, a a business uh, leaders summit. So if you just love the marketplace, if you love uh, kind of working in the corporate sector in February, the second week on the Saturday morning, we're kind of going to do three sessions with a pastor named Dave Balestri, uh, and he's a marketplace pastor, and um, also Roma Waterman, who's got a great prophetic uh, edge over a life, and, and they're going to be with us for, for a, a Sunday, sorry, a Saturday event. But we've called this event Set Apart. If you're in the marketplace, whether you're a developer, whether you're a builder, whatever you might be, whether you're a business owner, entrepreneur, whether you've thought about it or thinking about it, let me tell you something. God has asked us to be set apart. Yeah. There should be something distinct yeah. about us. He's not just calling us to success and favor but he's calling us to purity and distinctness. That that we would bow our lives with reverence. I pray that my speech, not just my life, but my speech would be holy. I remember when I used to work corporately and they knew I was Christian, um, you know, uh, people used to apologize because they used to swear around me. Has anyone had that ever happen to you before? Like, they go, I'm so sorry, I know you're a Christian, lies, and I'm sorry. And I used to feel bad for them when they, like, I used to be like, it's okay, you know, you do you, like, as in, I'm okay with that. But the thing is, I'm not saying that that should be the feeling, we, like, I don't want people to be fearful of us, but there should be something different about us. Yeah. Yeah. They sh- you know, the greatest insult as a Christian, no offense to us, but is when someone tells us, I didn't know you were a Christian. <laughs> you should find that offensive. I, I didn't realize that you, you go to church and that you follow Jesus. That should be an insult to us. You know, God did not say to us, hey, like we're supposed to be undercover Christians. You're like, but it's true, right? Like, it's not like it's going, hey, let's just try and hide away and then, you know, one day we'll pop up. We're supposed to be set apart. We're supposed to be different. I think we've gotten the scripture mixed up, thinking that we are supposed to be in the world and like the world. No, in the world, but not off the world. I pray that our conduct will be holy, that our decisions will be holy, that our actions will be holy. I pray that my marriage, our family, our home will be holy. Next year, we're inviting um, pastors and leaders from all around the nation to help us uh, and equip us in our marriages and parenting. And so there's going to be weekends that we're going to say, hey, we want you to come along. We want to invest. We want to speak to you and help us parent, help us to have a stronger marriage. But here's the thing. It's all so that we can work towards and walk towards holiness. Imagine a church that would choose a lifestyle that fears the Lord, that there is no compromise, that there is purity. One last thing I'll share about next year, I think, is... After Easter, 
Now, Easter happens very early in the year next year. Some of you are going, it's December, bro. Like, can we just talk about Christmas for a little bit? No, we're going to talk about Easter for a moment. After Easter, we are going to do, for the very first time, a 10-week series. We've never done a 10-week series before. I can see that you're all excited about this. Um, (laughs) But this 10-week series is going to be on the Ten Commandments. And here's the thing, and this is a call to holiness. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to, we're going to make it as engaging as possible. It's going to be across our campuses. I'm going to ask the church to do two things. And, and, and listen, on these weeks, we're going to talk about things like, you know, how to find contentment, how to hold on to the truth, thou shall not lie, how to affair proof your marriage, how to not commit adultery, how to manage your anger, thou shall not murder. But the thing is, is that I'm going to challenge the congregation during this 10 weeks. Not only would you invite people to church, some of you are going to laugh at this, but I'm going to challenge every congregation, Doreen, Craigie, Burn, and Fundura, to come to church 10 weeks in a row. Yeah. Some of you are like, there's a long weekend in there. <laughs> 10 weeks in a row. Why? Because we will count the Sabbath as holy. It's a commandment. Yeah. And I pray that as a church that we'll be able to train. Right now, let's not be legalistic about this. You know, let's not be like, hey, where are we? But I pray that there is a sense of reverence for the house, the reverence for how we function and what we do. And so we're going to go into this, and we don't follow these commandments. We don't do these things out of fear of God, but we do it to please God because we are accepted by him. It should be the desire of your heart to please him. When Moses was on holy ground, there was a change of posture. Literally, there was this raw moment, but yet it was intimate. It was so raw, but yet it was so intimate. Think about it. He had, he had um, murdered someone 40 years earlier. He had a messy past. But yet God calls him in this moment. God was able to connect with him in this moment. Moses had run away from his assignment. Moses was just serving and, and kind of being a shepherd of all these sheep. But yet in God's holiness, he finds and he chooses Moses with grace. But Moses... And you and I had to respond and have to respond accordingly. When God asks you to do something, we have to respond accordingly. We have to be willing to stop and see. We need to be willing to have humble hearts of humility. We need to be obedient. This is a life that bows. I'm going to invite the worship team up right now. Moses chose a life that bows before Everyone say see. see. Everyone say bow. bow. Let's try that again. See. see. Bow. bow. See. see. Bow. bow. No more. Okay, cool. Last one. Could have done that all day, let's be honest. With you. Could have created a wrap in between it too. See, bow, go. Everyone say go. go. It is on holy ground that God gives you an assignment that is beyond you. It is on holy ground. It is in his presence that he will give you an assignment that is, that is beyond your imagination, that is out of your skill set, that is out of your past, that you could never comprehend it. Verse 7, it says, The Lord said, I have seen the misery of my people. I have heard their cry, and I am concerned. He says, I have seen you, I have heard you, and I know you. But then he says, I have, I've, I've got a rescue plan. Moses, it's you. So now I am sending you to go, Moses. You know, I believe that when we have an encounter with God, I know from my my personal experiences, when I have had an encounter with God, I feel like he sits in the place where I'm at. I feel that he acknowledges that he's been hearing my prayers, that he hears my cry that he knows me. And it is in these encounters that I feel like I have the boldness and courage to go. To whatever he has called us to do, there is a courage that takes place from these encounters where I say, whatever God has called me to do, no matter how scary it is, no matter how messy it is, I'll go. It is on holy ground. It is when we are wondering and aware. It is when we are bowing and burning that our assignments are 
receive. And he will call you to something that you're not ready for yet. He will call you beyond your past. You're going, you have no idea what I've done or what I'm doing right now. He will call you beyond that. Call you beyond your willingness and comfort. You know, as each week goes leading a church, and I think I'm just going to take a guess. Maybe we're 23 and a half weeks in. I'm not sure. I don't even know anymore. It's all blurry. Is that what happens? Anyway, um, as each week goes on, there is a sense of excitement and wow, but there is also a sense of, uh oh. How are we going to do this? There's this, there's this sense that I know God has got this, but I have no idea what it's going to look like. There is a sense of excitement, but I'm going, God, like, just give me a little bit more. Like, just tell me what you're seeing. You tell me, tell me a little bit more. But as I read the, the story in Exodus, when I read the journey of Moses, I feel like I'm just in good company. Because you, you see, Moses had his questions. Maybe you're having your question right now. You, you're scared of the assignment God has given you. Maybe you have your doubts. Maybe you have your concerns. Maybe you're just thinking, whatever God has placed in your heart, it is impossible. It is scary. It is unthinkable. You're thinking why, who, how, and when. But watch verse 12 and 14. When Moses wrestles with God, what does God say to him in verse 12? God said, I will be with you. He is sending on an assignment. He's saying, I will be with you. Verse 14, it says, God said to Moses, I am who I am. I am a personal God that sees, hears, and knows you. I am the Alpha and Omega. I am, I am self-existent. That's what he's saying. I, before you could even conjure up anything, I was here. This is what you were to say to Israelites. I am sent you. This assignment, this go will come. This moment of saying, this is hold great. And your courage and your boldness will be able to say, God is with me. God is with me. He is for me. I am sent. You might be asking, What's next? What do we do now? I think it's important that we declare ourselves to ourselves that this is holy ground. So I, I pray for all of us here in this room that we will begin to see, that we'll be, become more aware of His presence, that we will live lives that will bow before the King of Kings. And when He says go, when he says left, we go left. When he says right, you go right. When he says decide now, we decide now. There will be a holy obedience about us. Would you stand to your feet? This is holy ground. This is holy. Would you just close your eyes right now? Would you just lift both hands? this prayer for you and I pray that this will open your spiritual eyes this morning don't be scared of this prayer would you receive it for your life this morning that we will have eyes that see receive this prayer this morning this was it. remove the scales from my eyes the calluses from my heart the stubbornness of my will help me to see you God would you enable me to enjoy your wonder Lord God, would you deliver me from routine worship, from business as usual worship? And would you energize me again? Would you help me to have faith like a five-year-old? Help me to seek you like a child that will imagine you, that will be aware of you, that will wonder.
hearts and eyes would become more aware of the burning bushes in our lives on the way home today, that, that we will note what is taking place. In our work days this week, that we will note what he is doing that we'll become aware, whether we look at a screen all day or look at kids all day, that we will know and we'll be aware of His presence.